Yeah, looking to the east, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and here we are at the one o'clock clock already on a given Monday with Steve Zercher, who joins us from Kobe, Japan, from Kansai Gaidai University. Am I right about that, Steve? I'm in my office right now. Yeah, if I took off the fake background, you'd see my books and papers and disheveled office. That's, yes, that's I'm splendid. In We're happy enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But this is a campus picture behind me as well. This is what Kansai Gaidai looks like. So, um, you know, we, we had an almost uh, hurricane um, yesterday, uh, over the weekend, I suppose. Um, mm. And uh, Douglas was the name. And it was, it was national news that we were in line for this hurricane. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Because we've had some terrible hurricanes before that have been disastrous. The most recent bad one was, I think it was Iniki, 1991 or 1992. Um, yeah, I remember that. It was really devastating. They hit um, Kauai, right? Bro primarily. Right, bro it broke Kauai in pieces. Um, and you know, and now this one was a nothing burger, uh, I like to say, because it didn't really affect any island. And we had a lot of news about it, and the, the media were really churning it out. But really nothing happened. And this happens you know, in Hawaii. I mean, we had more nothing burgers than we have real storms, although that does not foreclose the possibility that in the next few months between now and December, effectively between now and election day, <laughs> um, you know, we will have some more weather, bad weather, mm -hmm. extreme weather, the kind of weather you get only in climate change. Um, and mm -hmm. so we have to think about it and no storm can be taken lightly. Uh, mm -hmm. On the other hand, this also points out that Hawaii is really not resilient, uh, either from a, um, you know, an energy point of view or from a, a uh, life and safety point of view, from an agricultural point of view, we really haven't worked that out at all, even though we have an ongoing, in fact, an increasing threat of extreme weather. And I wondered if we could compare Hawaii in, in you know, its uh, consciousness of this issue, its sustainability and resilience against uh, storms, its ability to come back against storms after storms, with Japan. Mm -hmm. Japan has had its fair share of earthquakes. Um, oh, yes. You whiz, uh, you had a terrible time a few years ago. Um, with, with Fukushima, and right. I wonder if you can give us a handle on how well Japan is prepared. Yeah, um, this country is at unique risk for natural, uh, natural disasters. Uh, it has more earthquakes than any other country in the world. Um, so there's a, a built-in mentality within the government and the population overall that at any given point, everything could be destroyed. I mean, literally everything could be destroyed. Uh, the occurrences of tsunami, uh, tsunamis uh, is increasing, just like maybe you've observed in Hawaii, the season is becoming longer, the intensity of these storms is increasing. In Kobe recently, we had a major tsunami come through and it did significant damage um, to the Kansai region. It shut down the airport. Maybe you remember that, uh, that also made international news. Uh, a ship ended up breaking loose and ramming the one bridge that ran into the Kansai airport. So there was no in and out traffic for a number of weeks and it just devastated international travel. This is pre-COVID before we've gone through that disaster. Um, so there's a consciousness among the people, among the government in terms of we will face these things. Like in Tokyo, they have scenarios that they've already planned out. They have predicted an earthquake of a certain size and intensity will occur in the next 10 to 15 years. It's, it's a given. And the estimates are that up to 50,000 people will perish, will die Ooh. when that does happen. I mean, this, this is what they're facing. I mean, I, I give them credit for facing reality. This will happen. Um, so there is a lot of preparation and infrastructure development and a lot of planning. Um, but I've been here a long time and uh, I'm not an expert on this. I'm hoping to bring an expert for the next show, a couple of weeks, someone who really understands this well. His name is Dr. Robert Eldridge. He's been on Think Tech before. But my observation is that the best plans and the best intentions kind of fall apart when the crisis actually occurs. And the, the worst example of this is in 1995 when Kobe had a major earthquake which devastated the city, 5,000 people perished um, when that occurred in 1995, and the government response was abysmal. It was so bad 
that when the prime minister, his name was Muriyama at that sign at that time, he finally came to Kobe after I think three or four days. He he didn't say anything at all about this. There was no official response. And finally, he he acknowledged what happened and said, "We're going to try and do the best we can." When he came here, you know how reserved Japanese people are. They threw vegetables at him. <laughs> they were so frustrated oh, that it boy. was like watching a bad performance of a musical or something. Yeah, so he didn't come back again. So unfortunately, even though I think there's high awareness and high planning and intense investment in infrastructure to try and protect Japan against an earthquake or a hurricane uh, or other national uh, disasters like flooding, we're, we're experiencing flooding right now in Kyushu because the amount of rain that we're getting every year is just going up tremendously again because of climate change. This is uh, in, in Japan, we don't have the political issue that you have in America about the deniers. So this is reported all the time. There's more rain occurring. So Kyushu is trying to recover from flooding and it's kind of a mixed bag. So I don't know, maybe uh, Robert can explain more about his perspective on this when he comes on the show. But my impression is that there is awareness, there is planning, but when the event occurs, it doesn't seem to be all that effective. You know, your comments remind me the the issue about, um, you know, the level of response, the effectiveness of the response. It reminds me of uh, the Black Death in um, uh, 1348 or thereabouts uh, in Europe, starting in, um, it came it came from Turkey, I think, and, and then it came through uh, to uh, Sicily and then to Messina and then to mm -hmm. Italy in general. And from there it spread uh, to France, Germany, and ultimately England. And, mm -hmm. uh, and and it killed half the people in Europe, about half the people in Europe. And they didn't know what it was. They had no idea what, what the process of this disease was. Mm -hmm. Fact is, it was a bacteria for, carried by a flea that was carried by rats. And, um, and they didn't know, so they just didn't take the right steps. The only guy who did the right thing was the Pope. The Pope built two fires in his chambers and he would stay close to the fires. Rats don't like fires. He saved himself. <laughs> what can I say? <clears throat> but anyway, uh, not, to, not to dwell on that. What is very interesting is in the social aspect. The first reaction that people had was to try to help each other. You know, the we're all in this together uh, trope. Well, we're going to work together, save each other. And all this. But as in each place that, that the, the Black Plague, uh, you, know, pr you know, happened, um, th you had the same phenomenon. After a while, people didn't, didn't say that. They didn't say we're all in this together. It's every mm. man for himself. Right. Um, and and th they lost that, that certain uh, morality, that, that ethic about protecting your neighbor. Um, that was so interesting. And so I think it's a part of a human condition. But when you're really in, in distress, um, maybe you don't care so much about your neighbor. And it's a test of humanity. To test yeah. Well, let me give you an example from my own personal life. Um, I was in New York for 9-11, believe it or not. My brother-in-law got married that the Saturday before 9-11, before that Tuesday. Uh, and I was scheduled to fly out on United Airlines from Newark to San Francisco on the flight after United, I think it was 93, the one that was hijacked. So well, I was there. Uh, so we were in the hotel, we were getting ready to go to the airport and then the towers came down. It was so interesting, Jay, to observe New Yorkers who have a reputation for being individualistic and you know, kind of rough, right? You know, that's, that's the right reputation. That's not been my experience, by the way, in New York. But anyway, after that disaster occurred, the, the community sense just exploded. Uh, and there was so much bonding going on, at least over that short period of time after 9-11, because we were stuck there until Friday before they, you remember, they, they stopped all flights when that occurred. So we were there and I, I figured I, I would give blood, you know, I would donate because there was a call on media. And I went to the local gym. I had to wait eight hours to give blood because there were so many people there who felt the same sense of responsibility or commitment to try and help people who were so... You know, I don't know how long that lasted in, in New York, but at least through that initial few days, 
uh, New York came together in a way that I could not believe was possible. It was touching. I remember it. Yeah, it was touching. You do remember that? Yeah. I do remember. So I just happened to be there and observe that. Now, getting to this point about community, you know, COVID obviously is another disaster that we're all trying to respond to. Um, and America, of course, has failed miserably in terms of responding to it in a, in a responsible way. Whereas in Asia, um, pretty much uniformly, if you take a look at all the different countries, this is reflecting on the article that you sent me, Jay, from uh, Frank Ching, the death rates in the, the Asian countries are so much lower. I mean, it just doesn't even compare. So in the United States, it's over 450 per million that have died because of COVID, right? And in Japan, it's eight. In some countries, it's below one in Asia. And this gets back to your point about community. In Asia, maybe because of the Confucian history, uh, there's a sense of greater commitment to the community. And during a crisis like we're in right now in Japan, even though the government leadership has been haphazard and really inconsistent, I, I, from my own opinion, it hasn't been that much better than the United States, frankly. But the sense of community commitment to try and prevent something that is a threat to all and modifying individuals' behaviors for the benefit of the good of all is something that's fundamental to Asian cultures. So the example that I've given before is mask wearing. It is not mandated in this country. The Abe is, I mean, the government's recommending that people do it, but it's not mandated. But you get on the train, like I did yesterday, there is not a single person on the train not wearing a mask. If you got on the train without a mask, it, it would be like you're there naked or something. It's just socially unacceptable. Everyone recognizes that they have to make this effort, you know, whether it's effective or not, you can debate. But anyway, people believe it and the government believes it. So there's 100% compliance with that aspect of trying to protect all of us here in Japan from the influence of this deadly disease. And it's working. It's working across well, the Taiwan. There's a cultural there's background to it. I mean, if in Japan, if you have a regular, I mean, this is pre-COVID, PC, if you don't mind, pre-COVID. Um, okay. In Japan, if you had a cold, you'd wear the mask. Yes. And if you want to see the people on the street who have colds, look for the people who have masks on. And they're not doing right. this for themselves. They're doing it for you. They're doing it for the community. This has been, yeah. this has been a cultural point for hundreds of years, I think, in Japan. Yes. Yeah. There's a long history of mask wearing. And you're absolutely right, Jay. When I got here, when I was a student, I was 19 years old, and I noticed people were wearing masks. And my natural thought as an American was that, oh, they must think that I'm sick and they're protecting themselves against me or other people. As I learned about the culture, I realized, no, they're sick and they're protecting the other people from spreading the disease that they have to others. It's exactly the opposite of what I assumed based on my American cultural upbringing. So yeah, at any given point, especially during the spring, maybe 40% of people are wearing masks to protect others. Others are wearing masks because of allergies. That's a big issue in Japan. But now, even if you're not sick, you don't know that for sure because you could be asymptomatic. So it's 100% coverage. In any place that I've gone now where there's a significant group of people, it's 100% compliance with this. It's just, I'm still, even after being here so long, amazed to observe this. And in, in America, you know, my own home country, people feel it, it's, it's an, you're impinging on my freedom. You're my constitutional a right. I have a constitutional right yeah, to I, affect I, you. I, I, I don't remember right face masks you. being written in the constitution. Is, is there, is, is that one of the amendments that I missed? I think you must have missed that one. <laughs> I know I did. I mean, it's really, it's really awful. It's so, you know, forget about the constitution. It's immoral. It's unethical. It is, uh, it, it's indecent for somebody right. to say, I'm not going to wear a mask, even though I know that you are going to get what I have and you could die. But anyway, yeah. can, can you read the numbers out that Frank Ching included there? Yeah. Really, really important numbers for the U.S. and for the various, uh, what do you right. call it? Chopstick, the chopstick countries. Yeah, that's right. So let's see, in Taiwan, 
where the ethnicity of people is basically the same as mainland China, they reported 0 0.3 deaths per million people. Singapore is five. Thailand is 0 0.8, so less than one. Vietnam, as of this uh, writing, zero. No deaths whatsoever. United States, 451. United Kingdom, 674 deaths per million. Spain, 608. France, 462. Canada, 235. Germany, 110. It's remarkable. What a huge difference. Now, there are random factors to this. And one thing I've read is that, in general, the health of Japanese people is better. They're, they're, they're lighter, generally. Their diet is higher quality. So there's the Japanese researchers have looked at maybe there's a distinction between the overall level of health between Japan and the United States. And that may be a factor. But there, you cannot, I think, get away from this cultural influence the sense of we are part of a community, and therefore in a crisis, we need to protect all members. It's not just about me and what I want to do, and whether I feel comfortable wearing a mask or I don't feel comfortable wearing a mask. And frankly, this is my own opinion. The fact that Trump politicized this, that caused more American deaths. You know, he, he's a criminal, in my opinion, in that sense, that he politicized face masks, and had people say, oh, I'm going to, because I love Trump, not wear masks, that caused a greater spread of the disease. So anyway, that's my own personal opinion. That's Well, I'll tell you, you know, this, uh, this show will be posted, um, you know, on YouTube. And YouTube has, uh, it has uh, comments. And people, you know, watch the show, they'll watch this show from all around the country, and they'll leave comments. And I can guarantee you, Steve, there'll be <laughs> people who will criticize us and who will call right. us names for suggesting mm. um, that wearing a mask is better even if Trump doesn't support it because uh, they support Trump <clears throat> and I, I wonder how do you what, argue with these numbers you, well the question is whether people know these numbers this is Frank Ching you know writing in Hong yeah. Kong and Taiwan what have you um, you know for American publications and also local publications there uh, that may have been affected by the new security law in Hong Kong, but um, right. great columnist. He's been doing it for a long time. And uh, this, this article is really uh, an important article. So my question to you is the people in Japan, do they, do they have some awareness of the comparison of the, the chopstick oh. country numbers and the American Jay, numbers they know? I, I am put in the awkward position, and I think all of us Americans that are living in Japan, of trying to defend the indefensible. People, Japanese people will ask me, what is going wrong with your country? Why is it a joke? Why are the death rates so high? You guys have the most resources. You should be a leader. You know, it should be much lower, the number of infections and the number of deaths. Uh, I, I don't have an answer for that, frankly. So yes, the Japanese people are very aware of what's going on in the United States and what the results are. I mean, they watch CNN and because uh, CNN is, is here in Japan, especially in the hotels and so forth. So, uh, and Japanese people tend to watch very closely. They're very aware of politics. Sometimes my wife brings up uh, issues about what's going on in Japan that I'm surprised she knows about, but she hears it on NHK, which is the national news agency. She also listens to some alternative news sources. Um, so she'll, She'll tell me, oh, yeah, Trump finally wore a mask a couple of days ago. I said, How do you know that? And so there's a high awareness of what the United States is struggling with right now. And basically, the conclusion is that the country is incompetent. It's kind of they, a joke. How do they feel about Tr Trump? Do they think that uh, his reelection would benefit Japan, uh, either on foreign policy or in some other way? Oh, Jay, you, you are the master of segues. So... Yeah, that's another thing I wanted to talk about. Um, and that is, who would be better for Japan, Trump or Biden? Yeah. Uh, there's been a number of articles that have appeared in the national press about this. And it is, uh, honestly, it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, 
there's a little bit of thinking it's better to deal with the devil that you know as opposed to the devil that you don't know so after three and a half years japan even though they recognize that trump has done several things that have not been in the benefit of japan for example immediately withdrawing from the tpp the trans-pacific partnership that was one of the first things trump did when he became president because it was a bad deal right uh, and that significantly damaged the the organization itself, which Japan was a major advocate of, frankly, because America asked them under the Obama administration to take a lead role. And also uh, with North Korea. So Abe, the prime minister, had been making North Korea the boogeyman because he's trying to change the Japanese constitution and make uh, Japan's military able to attack rather than just defend. Mm. MacArthur oh. built into the Japanese constitution that Japan can only defend which uh, Abe feels is, is a restriction on Japanese uh, political action and military action. And, you, know, you can argue the pros and cons on that. But in the middle of Abe demonizing North Korea, guess who goes to North Korea and says, oh yeah, Kim Jong-un, he's my friend. We're building a partnership here. So yeah. Abe's done several things, I'm sorry, Trump has done several things to kind of upset the, the table here, the cart here. But there are some people who feel like, yeah, we understand Trump, his pluses and minuses. Abe's invested a lot in the relationship. So Biden coming on board represents a little bit of a mystery uh, and therefore is unknown. And therefore maybe there's some who would feel, well, let, let's hope that Trump wins. Now, Biden's approach to Asia will be significantly different from Trump. You know, Trump is kind of haphazard. He just does what he wants. There's no coherent strategy whatsoever. Uh, and Biden probably will go back to the Obama, you know, pivot to Asia and work collaboratively with countries to try and, for example, contain the influence of China, which I think Democrats and Republicans both agree. And certainly the Japanese government and leadership also agreed that China is a significant threat in, on many fronts in terms of military power and economic power. So there is, I think, uh, there'll be greater collaboration within the Asia Pacific region, which I think would in the long run benefit Japan, but not everybody in Japan would recognize that. They'd rather have Trump because we know what Trump is. We understand what Trump is now after three and a half years. What, what would you say that most people in, in Japan would, would, would favor Biden or Trump? Oh, that's a good question. Let me, let me do some research on that. I, don't I haven't seen any polls on that, but my own personal guess would be because of COVID, uh, Trump's reputation is terrible. I mean, how, how, could he be, how could he be the president and let this disaster happen to the United States when there are certainly models of behavior, of government action, which are much, much better uh, in Asia to take a look at and so forth. So I think probably Biden would be favored. Usually, I think when Clinton and Trump were running, most Japanese people, because Clinton's awareness was quite high because of Bill being the president before and the fact that she had been a senator and secretary of state. So I think most Japanese at that point favored Clinton. And when Trump won, the country went into a semi-state of shock, as, as we all did. But uh, Japan, I remember when he was elected, the Japanese people were just, who is this guy? How could he win? How could he beat Hillary Clinton? Why did America elect this guy that we don't even know who he is? And all he's done has been on TV. So, <clears throat> He's, he's good with Access Hollywood and all that. Maybe <laughs> plays into it. But, uh, okay, we have a question I want to ask you. Oh, yeah, there's a chat. Great. Um, do you think that America's patriotism is the most dangerous thing to America right now? Do you think that America's patriotism is the most dangerous thing to America right now? Uh, that's a hard question. Make of it what you will. Yeah, if you, if you mean by patriotism nationalism, exceptionalism, uh, maybe, I, I think as an, as an expat, a long-term expat, I have this emotional and kind of psychological distance now from my own home country. I'm, I'm still an American and I, you know, I love my country and I feel uh, connected to it, but it does give me the perspective to look at American activity. And the fact that we think that we're so special and that uh, you know, we dominated things for so long, I think it blinds us to what's going on in the world. And I think a good example of that is the rise of China. I think just recently, America's beginning to recognize that China 
is an economic powerhouse and becoming a military powerhouse as well. And America needs to recognize that it's not just an American world any longer. I mean, there are many political scientists who are saying it, it's, it's China's turn now. You know, China yeah, will- Not the American century anymore. Yeah, and, exactly. And so that so takes I us to the last question I wanna to put to you, which is a good segue from what we've been talking about. Yes. Uh, it's the article you and I have shared uh, which raises the question of, of what the Chinese people think about Biden versus Trump, uh, whether um, they, they favor one or the other, and who is it? Uh, and, and who would be better uh, for the relationship and for China? Yeah, this, this is an important question also for Japan because Japan is caught between the middle, the United States and China, um, politically, Japan's allegiance and alliance is to the United States, and it's been that way for decades. Economically, however, China is Japan's number one trading partner and has been that for many, many, many years. So this tension that exists between the United States and China deeply affects Japan. So this is becoming a political issue in, in America now. Trump is using China and Biden is using China in their national campaigns. So the question of who would China want as a president. And I did take a look at an article from the Atlantic magazine. So I think the perception generally by maybe most of the viewers of this uh, pot, of this webcast would be that uh, China does not want Trump because Trump is uh, potentially stronger. But the reality is if you look over the last three and a half years, China's rise has significantly increased under the Trump administration because Trump's policies have been inconsistent when it comes to China. Sometimes he verbally attacks them, other times he protects them. Like in Hong Kong, he's been very uh, accommodating uh, of what's going on right there and has not made any significant statements about preventing China uh, from doing what they're doing in Hong Kong or other activities as well. Um, so I did this article quotes some officials from China and their preference seems to be that they would prefer Trump to stay in office. So we want Trump to be reelected. We'd be glad to see this happen. The president's tweet makes him easy to read and thus the best choice in an opponent for negotiations. Another quote from uh, one of the uh, newspapers in China, they wish for his reelection because Trump makes America eccentric and therefore hateful for the rest of the world. And it makes it, you help to promote unity in China. He added that Chinese netizens call you, I'm gonna mispronounce this, I'm sorry for Chinese uh, speakers here, Zhongguo, J-I-N-G-U-O, which means Trump is helping to construct China. So they view him as the best leader of America in order for them to accomplish their own political and military goals. Whereas Biden, what might be more of a challenge because Biden would adopt a more consensus approach to containing China. Biden, for example, would probably have the America enter into the TPP. You know, he might do that right away. And that would, the whole purpose of the TPP was to try and contain the economic influence of China. And Trump withdrew from that and therefore strengthened China's own economic initiatives. So that's why China, at least at some levels, seems to think Trump would be better for their own benefit than a Biden presidency. Yeah, I'm inherent in that is that uh, uh, Trump is a failed president. Under him, the country fails. And China would love to see, um, you know, the, the country fail because it can fill the vacuum. It can it can become all all the more powerful. Uh, yes, relative that's to exactly the, the point that they're making here. It's there's a lack of leadership. In fact, it's actually a negative. Tr Trump is lowering the regard and reputation of America through COVID, withdrawing from the WHO, uh, threatening to withdraw from NATO. You know, he's done so many of these things, withdrawing from the TPP. So it creates this opportunity for China to fill the void. It, it's, it's not China's so good at what they're doing, it's that we're so bad right now and that China can expand without resistance. It's, it's like Mao's the art of war. Let the other guy fall on his sword. Let him, right. let him, let him fail by himself and you move in, you, you fill the vacuum. Yeah, if your opponent's screwing up, <laughs> if your opponent is screwing up, don't get in his way. 
And that's, I think, how China views the Trump administration right now. I would prefer yeah. a second term. But anyway, this, this morning I was reading that that's becoming less and less likely. I know people are afraid because Hillary was predicted to win before and Biden's now being predicted to win again. But the numbers seem to be pretty compelling that uh, it's looking like we'll have a Biden administration starting next year. Uh, from your lips to God's ears. Well, thank you very much, Steve. It's always great. Oh, to always my pleasure, Jay. Looking forward to uh, talking to you again in a couple of weeks. Uh, stay safe and be well. Thank you. Aloha.